Good morning, Christ Church. We're so glad that you are here today. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're with us online, we welcome you this morning. And now for our scripture reading. Hey, good morning. Would you please join me in our opening scripture out of Psalm 37, verses 1 through 3 and 39 through 40. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The salvation of the Lord is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. straight 
you would be seated in the Lord's presence. We have an opportunity weekly at Christ Church to gather around the Lord's table uh, where we come as a family from different walks of life, experiencing all kinds of different things throughout the week, but we have a moment where we can gather our hearts and we can come together. And so if you would, please pray with me. Most heavenly and gracious Father, Lord, we love you. We are so grateful for an opportunity to come to this, your table. Lord, we pray as we steady and calm our hearts that you would allow our minds to focus in on you, the sacrifice that you have made, that each of us uh, can believe in your promise, that we have the ability to shout to you, that we have the ability to worship you. And so God, as we come into this time uh, as a family, if there is anything that prevents us from joining in unity uh, with open hearts and open hands, I pray God that you would lead us lead our hearts, uh, convict us in such a way that only your Holy Spirit can. We ask this in your son, Jesus' name, amen. And if you would now join me in a corporate prayer of contrition. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. And if our communion stewards would come forward and our altar prayer team as we prepare to partake of communion. We've, we've heard this many, many times. Um, and so it's very important as we say this that we really think about what Jesus has done for us and what that means for each of us, uh, not just each of us, but corporately as a family, what that means for our access to salvation, for our access to healing. Um, so as, as I say these words, if you would just close your eyes and just think about uh, this moment as our Lord Jesus is headed to the cross. Uh, it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, simple bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and he turned and gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat, do so in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ broken for each of us as we take and eat. And in the same way, he took a cup and he said, this cup represents a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink, do so in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, this is the blood of Christ shed for each of us as we take and drink. And if you would, as before we come forward, join me in the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I will serve our communion stewards, those who will serve you, and then once that is done, they will take their place. And as the spirit leads, feel free to stand and come forward. We'll have serving stations in the balconies on each side and here on the floor as well and here in the center. Uh, there will also be persons up front who would love the opportunity to pray with you. So if there's something that you've carried in, don't take it out. Here's an opportunity to bring it to the altar and leave it at the feet of Jesus. Amen.
and there's nothing like corporate prayer. So here's our opportunity to do that.
Lord. As we move forward into uh, our next part of worship, uh, I would just encourage you to go love on someone, show them the love of God, share the peace of God. You can tell them, peace be with you, and they will say, and also with you. So go love on somebody this morning, amen. It's always, always, always a good thing when the people of God get together and pray for each other, encourage each other, okay. get a chance to share the peace of Christ that we have received with one another. And uh, I want you to know this morning, if you haven't been able to tell, this is VBS week. Just a little bit excited for that. It's going to be great. And, uh, and right now, I, I want to invite three of our very special VBSers up here with me. Uh, I want to invite Emma and Zeke and Lulu to come up here. They're going to model our T-shirts. Come on up here, guys. Come up here with me. Come on, come on, come on. You guys doing okay this morning? All right. These are just three of the... So far, we have, I believe it's over 250 kids registered with more coming. Yeah. And uh, so this is going to be an amazing, amazing week. You can tell the set's already amazing. Thanks to the choir and our worship team for you know, being flexible and, and jumping all over the place to try to make this work. And we wanted to share this with you all this morning. And, uh, and you can see, so what do we got on our, our t-shirts this week? Following Jesus changes the game. I'd say so. 
Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So what we want to do this week is, is this is such a special and important time. And so uh, you know, I'll be talking about Jesus and, and how he talks about greatness in the kingdom and what children have to do to reveal that. I'm talking about that in the message today. And uh, we want to recognize that we have this immense privilege this week to have all of these children from, from our own congregation, but also from the surrounding community and all throughout the city coming to join us. And, and I want you to know that, that we have so many great leaders and volunteers that, that I'm going to call. If you're, if you're a leader, if you're a volunteer serving with us this week uh, and, and all of our kids that are here as well, uh, I want you to come on down right down front. We're going to pray with you, pray over you right now. So, so come on down. We're going to meet right down front. Let's go right down front, guys. We're going to meet them right in front of the altar here. Let's do that. And as we do this, I want you to know we still need some help. So this week, VBS is happening in the mornings. We need more adults. Like I said, this is, this is the thing. Right now, we have what's close to being called a wait list for VBS. That's crazy. Hear me, Christ Church. We don't want to turn anybody away. We don't want to say, no, we, we've got way too many kids and not enough adults to help out. We, we can't do that. We can't do that. We have almost 50 youth who said, I'm, I'm here. I'm here to help. I want to be a part of this. But we need also some adults to come alongside that. We have an awesome team with some great adults already, but we need more. So if you are willing and able to do that, uh, we're going to have more information on how you can get plugged in here in just a minute. But at the same time, we have a, a, a training that's happening with lunch provided right after service today. We want you to be a part. So you come talk to me. You can talk to Shelby, who's going to be up here in a minute, our communications director, who's helping us out with coordinating everything with, with Christy and our, our children's team. So we want to make sure that we do not miss the opportunity we have. The God-given opportunity we have to reach these kids and these families. Amen? Amen. All right, so I don't know why everybody went to the left, but I... <laughs> so anyway, all right, so here's what we're going to do. I want you to extend your hands. Let's pray over these kids, these leaders, and all those that, that aren't with us this morning, but will be this week. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you praise that your light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. You have done so much to provide this blessed opportunity for us to, to proclaim your gospel and to share and show the love of Jesus with these children and with their families, those who are here and those who will be coming this week, Lord. Some of them know and, and love you already. Some of them have, have, have barely even ever heard your name. But Lord, let this week be a time where your light shines, where your love is seen and felt and received Lord God, where hearts are opened to the truth of your word and where your spirit draws those who would receive you closer to you and professions of faith, yes, Lord, but may lives be changed. May lives be impacted. May your truth go forth and lives be redeemed, Lord. We are so honored and privileged to be a part of this, Lord. So right now, those who have yet to be a part of this, there, there are adults here I know that are called and you are mentioning and motioning in their hearts right now, Lord God. Let them respond in obedience. Lord, let us not miss the opportunity you've been given, uh, we've been given, I should say, by you, Lord. So we are thankful and we are grateful for how you are providing, how you are leading, how you are guiding. Let us be obedient with joy and thanksgiving for the harvest is plentiful, Lord God. And we ask that you would send the laborers. We ask that you would prepare the hearts and minds. Lord, bless these men and women of all ages who have already said, yes, Lord, here I am, send me. Equip them this week with, with energy, with life, with love to share in abundance. Holy Spirit, just fill them now in any way that the enemy would come against them to, to, to distract them in mind or body or spirit. Lord, we come against that in Jesus' name. We ask you to fill them afresh, Holy Spirit overflowing with love, with joy, speaking the truth of your word. Change us, Lord. May we be a church on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. What a blessing and a privilege and opportunity to do that. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to dismiss our kids and our leaders to their place of worship now as they continue with Children's Church. You guys are awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all.
so good. Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Shelby Anderson. And as Pastor Ben said, I've been part of the, all this craziness this week. So forgive me for being a little sleepy, but I am so, so, so excited about all that God is going to do this week. And um, as a reminder, Pastor Ben mentioned it, but if you are serving at VBS or you want to serve at VBS, please come meet us at the uh, very top floor, level three, Montel Hardwick Hall, as we like to call it, for free lunch. Who likes free lunch? That's it? All right. Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll find a way for you to serve. So even if you can just serve one day, please come. We'll find, we'll find a way um, and would, would love to have you connect and, and love on our kids. So if you're new with us this morning, we'd love to have you connect. Um, connect with us. We don't want you to just come in and, and, and worship with us and, and, and pray with us and, and then leave and, and, and not know... Um, not get a chance for us to get to know who you are. And so we would love just to say hello. You can stop in the fo- uh, out in the foyer to meet our Connect team, or you can text us, keyword connect, to 615-205-1098. And this gets skipped over a lot, but I don't want to skip it over, and I made the slide, so I get to talk about it. Um, uh, text the keyword updates um, to the same number. If, you want, if you're like, I'm not new, but I, I don't want to miss what's going on. I, did, I didn't know there was VBS sign up, or I didn't know... Um, you know, our worship night was happening, please text the keyword updates and you'll make sure to get on that on that list. All right, next Sunday is Benevolence Week, um, Benevolence Offering. And so what that means is, is, you know, as a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ, this is a, a way for us to tangibly do that. And you'll see on the graphic the, a picture of, of Nashville. And, and that's what this offering is for. It's so that if anyone in our community comes to us and says, hey, I need a little help with rent or I need a little help um, feeding my family this week, these funds allow us to, um, to meet those tangible needs. And we all know that sometimes we, we need help, right? And sometimes we're blessed to be able to, to offer that help. And so would you just prayerfully consider how the Lord might lead you to give? We'll, we'll have our, our regular time of, of giving. And then um, at the end of the service next week, um, we will we'll connect that, but collect that benevolence offering. And baptisms are on July 30th. Uh, they're going to be a, just a, always a special time. We'll have our kids with us in the service. I'm, I'm praying every day that we'll have, you know, 10 more kids that will um, uh, prof- proclaim Jesus as their Lord and Savior this week and, and be added to that list. But if any adults or youth in the room have been um, thinking about baptism, wanting to know more about baptism, we've got classes the next two weeks, um, July 13th. Or, 16th and 23rd um, that Pastor Andrew will lead when he gets back and uh, we'll just be so excited to, to walk through um, what baptism looks like with you and you can sign up at ccnash.org slash baptize all right that's all um, we, <laughs> I know that's a lot we try not to hit you all with too much but um, there's so many exciting and wonderful things happening in the life of the church and we're not a perfect church but we serve a perfect God amen, amen. And we'd love for you to be part part of it. So as we transition into our time of giving, I'd ask the ushers to to prepare, and we all just bow your your hearts um, and and posture your your minds and center your minds on um, thankfulness and uh, gratitude for all that God has has given us. May we um, give back what's already His. Pray with me, Lord. We love you. We're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for how you're moving in our midst. God, I just, I I pray that you would be with every heart and soul here, every gift that is given. Lord, may it be used to further your kingdom. God, it's all, it's all yours. It's all yours. You've asked us to steward it. May we steward it well. May we be a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.
stand with me how many of you can testify that God keeps God's word Amen. that he finishes what he starts now here, here's the thing here's the thing God gives us opportunities in this life to see him bring to completion things he's begun in our lives or in the lives of those around us and then there are other things that, that, that we need that encouragement. We need those testimonies because there's other stuff that he still hasn't finished yet. Amen? There's other stuff we got to walk through. There's other stuff we have to experience in our own lives and the lives of those around us. And, and even as a, as a body, even as a church, there are things that, that, that he has to continue to lead us in. And he says, I need you to remember. I need you to look back and remember. Remember my faithfulness. Remember what I have done. Remember what I led you through. Remember my promises that I have kept. I will keep the promises I have yet to fulfill. That's who he is. That's who he is. Today, we need to humble ourselves like children and receive that word and believe that word. So Matthew chapter 18, this is where our gospel reading for this morning comes from, the first five verses. This is a chapter where Jesus is teaching his disciples on what it means to, to walk in the way of the kingdom together as his children, as, as, as the children of God, as, as the church. And this chapter has so much. How do we deal with, with forgiveness, both receiving it and offering it? How do we work for reconciliation with each other? I mean, if that isn't a word we need in our world today. He talks about how to deal with temptation and overcoming sin in our lives. And it all begins, it all begins with these first five verses of chapter 18. Hear now what Jesus says in response to what his disciples ask him. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, open our ears, we pray. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. That we might hear your word. That we might see your truth. And that it may take root within our hearts, Lord God, put down roots that are deep, that it might grow in strength within us and bear fruit in and through our lives and in our relationships, Lord, that we might be a people known by our love, that we might be a people known by our peace, known by our joy. And when someone asks for the reason that we have these things, we all say, all because of Jesus all because of Jesus. So Lord, let us hear what you would speak now through the scriptures. Word of God, speak. Change us, transform us, renew our minds so that we might know and discern what is your good and perfect will for us and in us and through us. We are here as children. Speak, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is good to be back with you. Um, Aaron and the kids and I were up in the Midwest here for the last couple of weeks. Uh, I came back earlier this week and um, 
Aaron and the kids flew home late last night, got home about 11.30, and so if you see Zeke this morning kind of red-eyed, give him a cup of coffee and tell him to suck it up, but no. <laughs> Actually, don't do that, because if you give him any coffee, I'm sending him home with you for this afternoon <laughs> so the rest of us can take a nap. But no, uh, we had a great, great time at home and, and being with family, and uh, it's such a gift. My, my, I grew up in Iowa. Some of my family is still there, but my parents have lived in Sioux Falls, South Dakota for the last 10 years or so. Uh, my sister Brooke and, and her family are here in Nashville, have been for a long time, but uh, I'm the oldest, Brooke's the next youngest, and then our baby sister, she and her family live in Sioux Falls too. So it was lots of great cousin time and grandma and grandpa time. Then we went, we were there for about a week. Then we went north to uh, Northwest Minnesota where Aaron grew up. We were there for a week and Aaron is the second of six kids. And uh, everybody in her family has uh, at least three or is working on more or whatever. So it's a tribe when we get together. It's a big, big old family fun fest. And uh, we had to spend, got to spend a lot of great time with them. And, and then uh, Luke and I, my oldest son, we even got a chance to go up into Manitoba for a few days, do some fishing with uh, my father-in-law and my brothers-in-law and had an amazing time. That, that refuels my my uh, batteries, so to speak. It recharges my batteries like nothing else to get out way off grid. And I love to fish, I love to hunt, I love to hike, I love to do all those things. And so getting a chance to do that, especially with, with my son and, and family like that was, was a great blessing. So, so I wanna say thank you on behalf of my family for, for allowing us that time to, to refuel and, and connect with, with our family back in the Midwest. And it was a great gift and, and we're very thankful for that. And, and I wanna say thank you, of course, to, to Pastor Greg who preached uh, two great messages these past two weeks weeks on change. What a powerful, powerful series of messages. Amen. If you, if you miss those, uh, I encourage you highly go back online and, and, and let Pastor Greg, let God through him teach you about the change that we want. Uh, and somehow in some ways that's the same. And sometimes it's different than the change that we need and how important that is. And so I encourage you to do that. So thanks to Pastor Greg, who's with us online. I know today is he's, he's doing some traveling. And so I uh, want to let you know, uh, of course, Tanja is already out. Uh, Pastor Greg's wife out in, in uh, D.C. started her new job this past week, and she's doing great. And she hasn't taken over the city yet, but that's probably coming up. So, so we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted on that too. Pastor Greg is with us uh, for the remainder of, of, of the summer, and then he'll be joining her out in D.C. in September. But uh, So we're, we're thankful again for, for who they are in the life. Life of the church, not just Christ church, but God's purposes and God's church throughout the world. Amen. All right. So like I said, VBS is happening this week. That's the best uh, Nintendo Switch controller I've ever seen up there. Uh, my boys walked in and said, man, check that out. They, they spend uh, too much time on one of those as it is, but they, they relate to it and see it well. And, and this week, I know kids are going to come into this space and they're going to uh, be so excited about what this means to discover, uh, you know, how Jesus changes the game, following Jesus changes the game. And I, like I said earlier, it's so important for us as adults to recognize how much the Bible has to say about the great and God-given responsibility we have to teach our children about the Lord and to model for them what it means to, to walk in the way of the kingdom of God. But at the same time, at the same time, how many of you know how much the Bible also has to say about how much children have to teach us if we are serious about coming to know the Lord better and learning to walk in the way of the kingdom. Because there's a certain way we experience the kingdom. There's a certain way we enter the kingdom as Jesus is teaching us today. So today we need to ask two key questions with that relationship in mind. What we have to teach children, but what children also have to teach us. And those questions are this. Number one, what does it take to be great in the kingdom of God? And how can children help us learn what that is? With that is another question. How and why does God's definition of greatness seem to differ so much from our human definitions of greatness? So let me ask you a question. Let's start it out this way. How do you think our society defines greatness? What factors do we look for or look at in others and in ourselves to define greatness? Go ahead, shout them out. What do you think? 
Success, status, money. What else? Power. Fame. Say it again. Degrees. Yeah, education. Say it again. Followers. Yeah, that social media thing. How many likes? How many shares? How many views? What else? Strength. Say it again. Control. Influence. Looks. Appearance. Education. Reputation. Yeah. Excellent. Any others? Access. Say it one more time. Access. Access. What you have, oh, access, possessions, what you have, right? Yeah. Your, your heritage, your breeding, yeah. Position. Position. Man, you guys are on it. <laughs> all of these things, all of these things, thank you for your help with that. All of these things are absolutely how we assess and define greatness in our culture. And that, that's not just an American thing. That, that, that's what human beings do, right? That's our problem. This is how we develop our defective definition of what greatness is. Just like those earliest disciples of Jesus had done the same thing, which we hear about in Matthew 18. If you turn to Mark's version, you don't have to turn there right now, but maybe later on if you get time, go to Mark chapter nine. Because when Mark tells about this encounter, we learn that the disciples were actually arguing among themselves about which one of them, who among us is the greatest. Long before Facebook was even a thing, right? But isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Because what we will see this morning, I pray, is that, is that while the disciples think that the question is, who among us is the greatest? Jesus is going to show them that they don't even know what true greatness is according to God's definition, according to the way of the kingdom of God. That's the real problem. That was the real problem for them then, and it's the real problem for us now. So think about this. From the time we are born, starting very early in our childhood, all the way up until this very moment on this present day, there are all kinds of voices around us attempting to convince us what greatness by human standards really is, right? And as a result, what happens? We learn from our earliest days to compare ourselves to one another by those standards, am I right? Who is the greatest? Who is the best? How many times has that question gone through your own mind since the time you were a little boy or a little girl? Who is the best student in my class? Who is the greatest athlete on my team? Who is the best singer in the choir? The best musician in the band? Who is the, the best looking? Who is the most popular? Who has the best house, the best car, the most money? Which kid never has to worry about if they've got enough money for lunch at school? Well, all of these things, from the time we are children, and it keeps going, right? Who's the best in sales at your company? Who has the most power and the most influence when you have a meeting? Who has the best yard in, on your block? Who is the best mom that you know? Who is the best Christian that you know? This is what we ask. Never stopping to consider, am I judging by the right standards? Whose definition of greatness am I even operating with? Because this is what we do. We compete and we compare, we judge, we evaluate, we rate and we rank. That's what humans do. But that's not even the worst part. The worst part is, after and while we do all those things, then we assign the highest value to whomever we deem the greatest. That's why so many want to be the greatest in something or in some way. Because why? Because everybody knows who you are. Everybody respects you, everybody honors you, everybody loves you or fears you. People want different things, but greatness. Well, that's what we think will give us those things. That's how we humans define greatness and that's why we humans desire it. Again, according to the world's definition of it. But what does it take to be great in the kingdom of God? And how can children, according to Jesus, teach us this? 
Remember what we just read, Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were trying to settle an argument. They're trying to decide the pecking order in the disciples. They're trying to figure out which, we, we think we know which one of us is the, is the best, the most important, the, the most to stand at your right hand, but, but we need to hear it from you, Jesus. I'm sure they had no idea he was gonna respond the way that he did. So he calls a child whom he put among them and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well change, how? how? Then he says, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God are the same thing. Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. The other uh, gospel writers use the term kingdom of God. This is that, that, that realm of existence, that way of life where God's rule is supreme, where, where God is recognized for who God truly is and all of life is, is brought under God's authority, God's power, God's saving grace and love. It's not just where we go when we die. It's a way of living that begins when we surrender ourselves to Christ now. So what does it take to be great in the kingdom of God? Jesus just said, humility. Humble yourself like a child, Jesus says. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we need to make sure we understand there's a great difference between being childish and childlike. Do you know the difference? <laughs> When we are acting childish, we think and, and act or say things like, mine, <laughs> me first. He started it. She hit me first. I want what I want and I want it now. That's not fair. These are reactions we have when childish impulses take over. That's being childish. Childlike is something very different. When, when Paul said, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I grew older, I, I, I put away childish things. Jesus is talking now about what it means to be childlike. He's not excusing us in immaturity or ignorance or naivete. He's not saying pretend like you don't have responsibilities or pretend like you don't have things you need to learn. Jesus is not renouncing wisdom or intelligence or education or any of those things. Quite the contrary. This is something much more basic, much more deeper. He's saying whatever you do, humble yourselves like children. Well, how are children humble? Again, in Mark's version of this story, Mark chapter nine, verse 35, Jesus adds this phrase to help explain. He says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. That's another way to understand greatness in the kingdom. So, Here's the thing, what did servants and children have in common in first century ancient Israel? That's the question. A lack of social status. A lack of value in the eyes of those considered to be above them. So like we said, if you wanna be great by human standards, who's above you? Nobody. That's the whole point, isn't it? You're top of the list, you're number one, you're top of the charts, you're the very opposite of, of that whole last of all, servant of all stuff. The kingdom of God clashes so violently with our own culture. So often with our own church culture. The ways we measure greatness. When will we learn? that human beings look upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. This is the trap that we fall into so easily, so easily, my friends. And this is how and why God's definition of greatness differs so greatly from our own. Jesus says it has to be different with you if you are going to be his disciple, if you are going to even enter into the kingdom of God. It has to be different. Why? Because human definitions of greatness teach us to value others and ourselves by what we can do 
by how we look or over how much we have influence, power, and control, like you all said. We all know it. We all walk in that world every single day. But what happens? What happens, my friends, when the day comes and it will, when you can't do all that you used to do, or at least you can't do it as well? What happens when you don't look the way you used to look? What happens when you don't have the influence or the power or the control that you once had? This is the way of the world, my friends. Human beings will always lose their greatness according to human standards. It's only a matter of time. No one stays on top forever. No one stays number one. No one stays undefeated. Champions will rise and fall. So do corporations. So do nations. So do cities. So do neighborhoods. And my friends, even sometimes so do churches. Eventually, someone else is going to come along and knock you out of your place as the greatest. And what happens then? I remember when I moved to Nashville in 1999, man, Hickory Hollow Mall was the place to be. I joined Powerhouse Gym because they were giving away free clock radios. What's a clock radio, Ben? (laughs) All these kids today. But do you remember? Those of you who've been in Nashville for a minute, you remember what the Hickory Hollow Mall was? It ain't that today. Cool Springs is changing. I was down there two nights ago and, and I'm driving, I'm like, I can't believe how many buildings are empty in Cool Springs. Hickory Hollow Mall was, was the place. Then Cool Springs became the place. Now, now that's all shifting. All of this shifts in our, in our culture. This is the way human civilizations work. It's the way we think this is, this is what's great and then it's not. Then this is great, then it's not. Then this is, Jesus comes in in the midst of all of that and says this is all the illusion. None of this will remain. None of this is the truth in accordance with the way of the only truth, which is the truth of the kingdom of God. God's definition of greatness in his kingdom is so different. Why? Because God does not value his children's because of our gifts or our abilities, our talents or our appearance. Do you know why God values you? Because you are his. He decided you needed to be in this world. You needed to be with him. You belong to him. He made you so that you could know him, that you could receive his love and love him in return. And and what's more than that, that you could share his love with those that he will lead you into relationship with in your life. That's exactly what we're gonna do this week with all these 300 kids that come here for VBS and God willing with their families as well. I come here in the morning and, I, and, and I'll get here and I'm gonna to try to greet every single family that comes. I mean, I, that, that's, that's, I delight in trying to do that. I try to connect with those parents when they come. I try to connect with those parents when they leave because some of them will not have a single person greet them and look them in the eye tomorrow. I might be the only one. You might be the only one. And not just here, but at work, at home, on your street. These ways in which living in the way of the kingdom brings people into an awareness that there's a different way. There's a different way. Sharing that love. So when you humble yourself like a child, as Jesus says, here's what you are doing. You are choosing to embrace the freedom that God offers through his kingdom. And how do you do that? You make yourself low. You humble yourself like a child. It's the exact opposite of what our culture will tell you makes you great, makes you strong. That doesn't mean you're a doormat. That doesn't mean that you don't don't stand up for what's right. It doesn't mean that we don't walk in, in, in working for peace and working for justice. Yes, we do. But our enemies are not flesh and blood. Our enemies are powers and principalities in the heavenly places. We have to recognize who our enemy is and it's not each other. lowering yourself in this way, walking in the humility of a child 
entering into the kingdom means that we have freedom no longer to have to feel like we have to compete and struggle to be somebody by the world's definition of greatness. We have freedom to come to Christ and follow him as we all truly are before God. And you know who we are before God? We are like children. We have no real ability to advance or to grow in the life of the kingdom apart from his grace, from his power, from his provision, from his guidance. We are so utterly dependent upon our heavenly father. And the world will define greatness in so many ways that fights against that idea, that denies that idea. We are, we say, gods unto ourselves, the masters of our own destiny, the masters of our own domain. We can make the world whatever we want to make it. We can be whoever, whatever we want to be. It's horrifying to some, Brian, but to others, they think that's liberation. They think that's freedom. And how many times in human history do we watch that ultimately crash and burn? The question is, how many people does it take down with it? Jesus came that we might have life and life abundant, that we might repent and receive the kingdom that is at hand. His kingdom. This is why Jesus says, You will never enter the kingdom unless you become like a child in this way. Jesus said you can only receive the kingdom like a child. Mark 10, verse 15. And this is where so many of us struggle, why many do not enter the kingdom of of God. This is why so many Christians even do not live into the kingdom of God now. Because we have to choose to become like children to humble ourselves. You and I have to make that choice. We have to learn to trust that God's way is the best way, that God's way is the only true way. We have to choose that. The child that Jesus put in the middle of his disciples, that that child had no status, that child had no power, no agency, no influence, no image, other than whatever those in authority decided to give that little one. child is utterly dependent upon his father, utterly dependent upon his mother. When I look at my boys and my daughter, my kids depend upon me to provide, to protect, to teach them, to lead them. And part of that journey is I have to teach them how to, how to walk in, in, in being and becoming the woman and, and the men of God that God has created them to be, that God has called them to be. One day they shall have to walk in that way with their own children. One day they may have to walk in that way when they care for their mother and, and me in our old age. There are many of you here today that are, that are caring for your, your, your parents who are aged. You're, you're doing that and you're walking in this way and you're seeing what does it mean to, to humble yourself? What does it mean to put yourself in the position of a servant? And God sees you and God honors you. The world may not. The world may say, this is what we do with putting people on the, on the edges of our society, whether it's the youngest, even the unborn, whether it's the aged, we shove them away. In the kingdom of God, it is not so. We are meant to be a people who say when Jesus comes to teach us how to love one another the way he has first loved us, we should look so different from the world. We have to be like children who depend upon our heavenly father, who understand that he knows what's best for us. We can trust his word. We have to learn his word and walk in his way. We don't want to see ourselves as weak. We don't want to see ourselves as vulnerable. But what does God say? My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Jesus said, unless you will die to yourself, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. But that's why we do not enter the kingdom of God. Thomas Merton said once, the pride makes us artificial. And humility makes us real. Think about that. Pride makes us artificial. How? You gotta keep up the appearance, baby. You can't let anybody know where the cracks are in your armor. 
see this in the church all the time. People come to the church and, 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 and whether it's this church or any church, and they, they, they want to be healed. They, they, they want to experience some sort of deliverance in their life. They want their life to be different, whatever that means to them. And the one thing that keeps them from doing that is a lack of humility and vulnerability. Now, many people have been hurt, and I understand that. Many people have been taken advantage of, and they've been abused, or they've been misused. And, and when they made themselves vulnerable before, somebody took advantage of them. And, and oftentimes, I hate to say, that's happened in the church, right? We get that. But you can't give up. You can't stop. Pride makes us artificial. It makes us be guarded thinking we have to defend ourselves and, and, and protect ourselves and it all depends on me and I can't trust and I won't trust. Humility makes us real. Humility opens us up to God so that God can do his work in us and God can bring us into a relationship with others with whom he's doing the same. And you know what happens then? Then you start to live. Some of you think you're living right now and you're not. You're not. You are not walking in the God-given freedom that Jesus died to give you. You know all the theology. You know the Bible verses you can quote. So many doctrines of the faith. But you do not walk in this freedom because you will not humble yourself like a child. James says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So as I wrap up here, before we pray, uh, Rick Warren, he was riffing on C.S. Lewis one time and he, he said, humility is this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. If only we understood how much freedom there is in that how much joy there is in that. Because our culture, I left my phone down there, but I was gonna act like I was taking a selfie. Our culture says, <laughs> self first. It's all about you. You are the star of your own show. And when I think of our kids who are, who are as we call them, digital natives, right? They, they don't remember a world before cell phones and, 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 and all the technology that we have with instant messaging, with, with YouTube, with everything else. They don't remember that. So the whole message they know about life and, and greatness and everything else has to do with how do I make myself known? How do I promote myself? How do I become my own brand? It's a soulless existence, ultimately. How do I market myself? How do I capitalize on my body? How do I capitalize on my talent? How do I capitalize on all these things? And what that leads to is that my value, literally and personally, become tied to that very thing. That's the world that we're sent to evangelize, church. That's the world that's in the church. kingdom of God is a different way. The kingdom of God has a different way. If you are choosing to change, to become humble as a child, as Jesus says, you are not thinking less of yourself. You're thinking more of God and more of who you are in relationship with him through Christ. Humility is essential to life in the kingdom of God. Next week, we'll talk more from Matthew 18 about how this is why Jesus starts with humility. If we're gonna talk about forgiveness, we, it all has to do with humility. If, whether we're receiving it or whether we're giving it. If we're going to talk about reconciliation, it has to involve humility. Otherwise, it won't happen. If we're going to talk about right relationships with God and with others and even with ourselves, when Jesus says crazy things like, if your eye offends you, gouge it out, or if your hand offends you and causes you to sin, cut it off. When he says things like that, that our culture says, what madness is that? It makes no sense if we don't understand what it means to humble yourself like a child. Make yourself low before God because humble yourself before the Lord and in time he will lift you So I ask you this day, today, will you humble yourself like a child anew before the Lord? It changes everything. 
how God will allow us to see ourselves in relation to God and in relation to one another, even how we will see ourselves. Because some of you right now, you are trying so hard. You are trying so hard to white knuckle it and hang on. I just, I gotta get through this. I gotta get through this. I gotta get through this. And why won't you answer me, God? Why won't you do what I need you to do? Why won't you move? Why won't you save me? As a pastor, I want you to know, I, I, I cry out to the Lord on your behalf. I do that in the middle of the night. I do that in, in Sunday mornings when I get here early and I'm praying before the service. All, all it is, we have so many people in this church that are praying for you, praying for each other on your behalf. But maybe what you need to do today is, is rest in the arms of your father and say, I am, I am coming to you as a child. I have no strength of my own. I have no resources, no power, no identity, no nothing that does not come from you. Dare to take Jesus at his word. Choose to be the greatest in the kingdom of God by humbling yourself like a child. Would you pray with me? Father, We ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive your word. And we ask that you would do that now, oh God. So many voices, so many messages trying to teach us what greatness is that are directly counter to what the gospel says. The gospel of the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ, Lord God, the good news that says the kingdom is at hand. Lord, for everyone here who desires to enter into your kingdom, to walk more fully in the life that Jesus offers us now and forevermore, Lord God, let us surrender. Let us submit ourselves. Lord, teach us. How to choose to make ourselves humble like children. Remove the illusions, Lord. Tear down our walls that we build with pride. Lord, we come to you with nothing. The breath that is in our lungs belongs to you. We convince ourselves we've built our lives, we've built our careers, we've built our families, we've built all of these things and we've built these kingdoms, Lord God. But your kingdom is the only one that remains. Yours is the only one that matters. Yours is the only one that's real. So Lord, enter into our workplaces, enter into our families, enter into our neighborhoods, enter into your church, Lord God, and have your way that we might humble ourselves, that we might recognize who you are with fresh eyes and open hearts. Let us learn to walk in your way, Lord God, like children teach us mold us, shape us as disciples of Jesus, as your sons and daughters by the Spirit. Lord, I pray right now that every heart, every mind hearing me right now, Lord God, let us take just a moment. I wanna invite you just to ask the Lord, Ask him by the Spirit to show you where in your life pride is holding you back. Where are you keeping yourself from walking more fully in the way of the kingdom? Where are you denying yourself entrance into his way? 
Where is your kingdom standing? That God's kingdom needs to overcome. Take a moment and ask him right now. Show us, Lord. Change us, Lord. Make us like children. Let us choose to become like children. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you're able, would you stand with you to your feet with me? We have a great privilege this week to minister to these kids and their families. Like I said, we need some more people who are going to answer God's call. And so I, I want you to reach out if you're willing to do that. Come come down, come to our meeting in Monta Hardwick Hall. Just come right up there after service here. Come up there, have some lunch, and we'll get you signed up. We'll get you some training. We'll run a background check on you. We'll take out several credit cards in your name. No. I promise we won't do that last part. But hear me, brothers and sisters. Hear me, Christ Church family. This, this is This is just the beginning. God has so much for us. The enemy has plans for our children, but God has far greater plans. And he's looking, he's looking for churches that say, here we are, send us. Here we are, send us in your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't let that just be a rote prayer. Let that be the mantra of your heart and your life. Let that be our prayer as a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. It is all through him and by him. Amen. Sing this with me. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him o'er and o'er Jesus Jesus precious Jesus bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. May he go with us now, wherever he may send us. He's promised to do that. You know that, right? <laughs> so let us go therefore to love and serve God and one another. Thanks be to God. Amen.